Hi, I'm Ivalice Page, and thanks for listening to the Believe Big Podcast, the show where we take a deep dive into your healing with health experts, integrative practitioners, biblical faith leaders, and cancer thrivers from around the globe. Welcome to today's episode on the Believe Big Podcast. My name is Ivelisse Page. Today's episode is all about ways you can detox your body for better health. I am so excited for you to hear from my friend, Dr. Haley Scoff. Dr. Haley Scoff is a licensed and practicing functional chiropractor, integrative health practitioner, and a podcaster with a master's in applied clinical nutrition. She is a former collegiate athlete who has a passion for teaching people how to bridge the gap between fitness and holistic health. With a focus on women's hormones and gut health, Dr. Haley has helped hundreds of people all over the world regain their health through lifestyle, optimal diet, movement, and functional practices. I am so excited for you to hear from her today. So welcome Haley to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I was just telling you offline It was so great when you had reached out and asked me to be on, and so I couldn't be happier to be here. (laughs) Aw, well, we are honored. We are so honored. You have so much knowledge, and to get a piece of that uh, for our listeners to be able to hear is really exciting. Uh, But before we start our podcast on actual detoxing, I would love, I know you have so many favorite health tips, and so I would love to know if you could just share just one of your favorites with us. Oh, okay. So I was thinking about this because I was like, wow, I have so many. What is my favorite one? But I would say my favorite one is reconnecting with nature. I think that's like probably a non-negotiable for me and something that I feel is really lost in our modern world. And that can look different, I think, in a lot of different ways. For me, I just feel better being outside, be going on a walk or a hike with my dog, or even just, you know, going outside. I was just on my deck answering emails in the sun, putting my feet on the grass, like just being connected with the earth and getting the sunlight on your skin and just getting the fresh air, even in the colder months. It's something that I prioritize because I think mentally, physically, emotionally, it's something that always recharges me. Yes. Yeah, I I completely agree. There's something about being outside that just helps your body to reset. And, you know, I've heard that from several people, actually, that they said to take your shoes and socks off and go into the grass. Why is that? So the earth has a charge so we can and and we are charged beings as well. So we can actually get the earth's charge via like being coming into contact, whether it's your feet, you're touching your hand on a tree, like we're able to absorb that. And it's really cool. They've actually done thermography studies where they show somebody prior to grounding and then after grounding and you can just see the inflammation dissipate. I mean, it's pretty, it's fascinating and you can feel it for yourself being on the beach all week last week. I, you know, my joints don't hurt. My skin is glowing. I just feel like recharged and energized. Your sleep is better. So, so many things you can see improve from literally just connecting with the earth. Wow. You know, and I always just thought the beach was the reason why I felt so good, but I bet that's such a huge part too, is that you're, you're, yeah, you're barefoot on the sand and uh, it just really revitalizes you in so many ways. So, well, that's a great tip. Thank you. Uh, So can you share with us uh, some of the reasons why we need to detox? This is such a huge topic, and I hear so much about it, but I'd love to know what are your reasons for the importance of it? Well, one, I think, you know, we live in just unfortunately a more toxic world now than ever. And, you know, you knowing so much about how all these different things contribute to chronic disease, especially cancer like we see all of these things kind of, we all have like this bucket and how quickly are we filling this bucket? How quickly, you know, what does the water look like that's going into the bucket? And that's kind of how I think of detox. It's, you know, a lot of people think of detox as the skinny tea or, you know, like the seven day detox. Whereas I think of detox as this is something my body does on a 24 seven basis all the time. But how, what can I do to be able to support it and to be able to help my body just get rid of things that don't need to be there or waste products from metabolism or food that we're eating so that it can just function optimally. Because if we think about, if we think about like a, a stagnant, 
pond, right? And it's got growth and there's no vitality to it. And it's a breeding ground for bacteria. And just it just doesn't look healthy. But when we think of a stream, like a fresh flowing stream, there's salmon running through it. It's like crystal clear. You almost feel like you could drink out of it. Like that's what we ideally would want in terms of constant movement, right? Whereas when we're not detoxing, when we're not moving things out, we think of more of like that sludgy pond. And that's really kind of what our bodies are internalizing if we're not optimally, you know, detoxing and just getting rid of things on a daily basis. And I think this this really became more so important to me or just clear to me when um, we saw my mom's cancer and we couldn't understand why. And then we realized that she was not a good detoxer. Like she never sweat. Her liver pathways were closed. And we can see now, obviously being on the other side, how when you're not able to get rid of things, how it can really make it so much harder for the body to heal when it's struggling on kind of all these different fronts. But it's crazy the the positive impact she saw when she actually started sweating and, you know, actually started doing these things. And so that was kind of the catalyst for me, obviously on a much more, you know, cancer is like a very serious thing. And like, that's kind of an extreme example, but seeing that on that basis and then looking at myself and saying, wow, I kind of struggled with those things too. Let me focus on those on myself. And now the patients and clients that I work with, you know, on subclinical levels, I think so many struggle. And so that's really a primary focus of what I do is helping people really be able to get those things online so that your energy can be better, your metabolism is better, your digestion and bowel movements, your skin is clear because the liver and your detoxification organs control so, so, so much of that. And if we can kind of get it before it ever gets to this extreme point where we're we're looking like that sludgy green pond, you know, why would we not do that? So, so good at you know, it's interesting that you say about people who have difficulty sweating or detoxing. I'm, I'm, I was a perfect example of that as well. And, and later find out that I have that MTHFR gene that helps, that has a hard time your liver, you know, uh, detoxing. And so for people who do struggle to sweat or to detox, what, what, like, what are the things that you did for your mom, um, you know, while she was going through that or people who do struggle, what are some of the best things that they can do to help them detox better? Definitely. So I think, you know, we implemented kind of a few things at once, but dry brushing is really great because you're getting, you're getting that lymph movement. So dry brushing is a really good idea. Um, I love pairing that with then the infrared sauna, which I think the infrared sauna is probably the best investment that my parents made, especially with my mom's healing journey. I mean, she went from never sweating to then she was sweating out black things, you know, like imagine what her body was getting rid of. I sweat out black before too, in our infrared sauna a few times. Um, And so you kind of look at that and you're just like, oh my goodness. And so, you know, I, obviously I could talk about sauna forever and, you know, it doesn't have to be an infrared sauna or a traditional sauna. You can, you can increase your body temperature by exercise. You can increase your body temperature by sitting in a hot bath. Um, you know, just being able to get your body temperature up so that you're able to perspire. And if you struggle to do that, I just, if you struggle to sweat, say you go in the sauna or you go in the bath and you don't sweat, you know, try dry brushing before. Try doing some like warming tea. I really like doing like ginger tea or something like that to like really raise your core body temperature and really kind of being consistent with it. Certain, you know, liver herbs like uh, milk thistle and N-acetylcysteine also can, you know, in a lot of cases be really beneficial for helping the liver and the lymph move a little bit better. So you can kind of pair those things kind of all together. I always think of like my nighttime sauna routine is, okay, we went for a post dinner walk. So we got the lymph moving. Now I'm going to dry brush and then I'm going to go in the sauna. And you know, you kind of, I kind of like habit stack all of these different things so that I can just kind of continuously reap the benefits. Wow. And so you do that every night? Pretty much. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. We don't have kids, so we just have a dog. So she's like our main priority. And I'm sure if and when we have kids down the road, that is going to change. But yeah, we eat dinner. We go for a nice walk around the neighborhood. We go in the sauna. And then it's kind of like our chill wind down time. You know, we do our reading. You know, maybe we do some meditating. We use essential oils, like drink our tea, all that kind of stuff. It's very, it's very ritualistic. But that's what I love about when I said that detox earlier is, you know, we think of it as like this cleanse or this you know, five, seven day juice thing. I think of detox as a lifestyle. So that's a lifestyle that I'm able to implement every single day, or if not every day, most days of the week, it's able to be consistent for me. And the people that I work with, I I always want people to 
implement something that they can see themselves doing down the road, because that's really how and why we see the results that we would see. I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. Jimmy, uh, my husband, Jimmy, uh, we invested in an infrared sauna. We have the sunlight in one and oh, okay. <laughs> and it was interesting though. Ours is called the believe. So I was like, Oh, that's great. <laughs> but he, uh, but he, uh, I, I would say it, it is the best investment that we make. We probably, I probably go in it three to four times a week. Uh, but now you've inspired me to try and do it every night <laughs> and see, um, one of the, one of the things that someone told me though, and, and sometimes for people that aren't familiar with that, that it's so important to shower right after the sauna, uh, so that those things that you've sweat out, don't go back into your skin. Can you share about that process for anyone who's interested in one or knows what the good process is? And, and then also, do you have a handout on the dry brushing that you could share with our listeners that we could put in the notes so that they know how to dry brush? Yeah, good. I I think I have a few videos on on Instagram, so I can uh, le- I can send those over to you. The dry brushing videos. Um, I'm making a note of it right now, so I don't forget. But f- in terms of you know sweating right at or showering after, it's so funny because then I've heard other things where people like there's some sauna studios that are like don't shower right after because that's the best time. But then you're like you said, you don't want that you don't want that stuff to continuously reabsorb. So I'm on the same page as you. I you know, I get out of the sauna and then we beeline it right upstairs. And I, I, in the summer months, I'm much better about this, but like a hot, cold shower, you know, it's really good for the mitochondria. It's really good for kind of that hormetic stress. In the winter, I have to just admit, I'm so bad at cold showers. It's not fun to do when it's, when it's already zero degrees outside, but yeah, I'll shower right after because especially with infrared, you are expelling a lot more toxins. So like with typical sweat, they say like one to 2% is toxins. Like most of it is just water, sodium, electrolytes, you know, which is still great. But with the infrared, they, some studies have even said like between 15 to 20% of that sweat can contain like bisphenol A, heavy metals. Um, so, cause infrared just gives like a little bit deeper penetration. That's not to knock any type of sweating, like any type of sweating I think is good, but especially if you're really getting out those toxins, like that I just mentioned, you really want to make sure you're rinsing them off right away and being able to not let them reabsorb into your skin. Because if you do, if they sit there, they will reabsorb into your skin. And then you're just kind of like spinning the wheels, you know, you're getting rid of them, you're reabsorbing your liver processes, you get rid of them. And it's just kind of this continuous cycle. So I always, I, I definitely recommend showering right after. Yes. Yeah. And, and for those listeners who, you know, are there, are there some great introductory uh, infrared sauna systems, you know, for someone that wants to try it out, but maybe can't do the sunlight or others. Um, mm. There's a good, um, I believe it's called the Therasage. It's like a single person unit. I have a lot of people who, you know, they might live in an apartment or like you said that, you know, they're not willing, like they can't invest in like a full sauna right now. So that's a good option. I know that the sunlight also makes a solo unit. It's like a, it's kind of like a, uh, like a little cabin that you lay in. Yeah. Like a little tent. That's a great option from what I've heard. I haven't personally tried it, but, um, I have heard about sauna blankets, but I always, I always wonder about the EMF exposure. Cause that's one thing that drew me to sunlight in, in the first place is because of their low EMF. And so I just, you know, with all the cords running through that are plugged into the wall. And if you're sitting there for 45 minutes to an hour, I just, I wonder about the EMF, but you always could look into a low EMF uh, sauna blanket. Those could always be a good option too. Okay. Yes. I think higher dose has one of those. Um, my, my friend got one and she loves it. I'll have oh, to good. get her to get an EMF tester to make sure. <laughs> to, to yeah. 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 And some of the companies, mm-hmm. like, I think they, well, if, if they're aware of it, they should say it online or that she can even reach out to the company. If you have like a question on what their EMF exposure is, because I know that that's something that sunlight and that was one of the first questions I asked was what is your EMF? Because I'm not, I don't want anything that's high. Yes. Yes. And I'm very sensitive to EMFs. And, and so that was an important question for myself as well. Um, so I know, and I see you posting a lot about your, castor oil packs Mm. and tell us about how castor oil packs are helpful for detoxing. Oh my gosh. They're probably one of my favorite practices because it's so easy. It's just, you literally put the castor oil on 
a cow, organic wool cotton pack and you place it over your liver. And it's something that's been used since like biblical times, right? And so castor oil is a really interesting oil because of the fact that it's allow it's it's able to penetrate the dermis of your skin. And so because it's able to do that, it's able to decrease inflammation. It's able to stimulate glutathione because that's kind of your liver's master antioxidant. It's able to really kind of get things moving in your digestive system. That's something I hear a lot of my patients say is, oh, I wear my castor oil pack and, you know, having a bowel movement this morning was so much easier. And, you know, it's able to increase dopamine, which is kind of like that feel good hormone that honestly, we don't feel a lot of in this very sympathetic go-go world. And so because of all of those different reasons, it's that's also stacked kind of with my nighttime routine. We get out of the sauna, I do my shower, I put on my castor oil pack. And so um, that's something that I've been doing for a long time. And what I will say is you just want to make sure that you use a good quality oil and you want to make sure you use a good quality pack. I remember when my mom went to a, like a holistic cancer center, she had been using castor oil packs for a long time, but they gave her castor oil and the castor oil was in a plastic bottle and the flannel was non-organic. And I said, you don't want to be absorbing BPAs through the oil into your skin when you're trying to detox. And you also just, you don't want to, cotton's very, very sprayed with glyphosate. And so, you know, my whole wardrobe is not organic. I wish it was, but especially when I'm talking about like, you know, with the oil and it's increasing so much more penetration, I I just really emphasize cotton and organic uh, hexane free castor oil because the the quality is really important just so that you you're making sure you're not increasing any more like chemical or toxic exposure. Yeah, especially someone whose immune systems are already compromised and you're trying to help your body detox, you're not wanting to add more in there. And I got the one that you had recommended from Queen of Thrones, and we can put the link um, on the notes as well. And I love it because it also has like this barrier, so it prevents it from getting really sticky and messy. And I love that it just wraps around and you can tie it. So it's a really simple process. So I will definitely share, you know, the notes on that. Um, and they also sell the organic castor oil and organic, you know, theirs is organic all around. So it's a really great quality one that I've tested personally too. So. Yeah. I'm glad you like that one. It's, I've used the ones where, you know, it's just like a flannel and then I'm putting it on and then I'm trying to like tie my robe around me to keep it in place. And it just, it was so messy. So I never really would keep it on that long, but now I just sleep in it because like you said, it's not very messy. I just wear a big baggy t-shirt, you know, something that I don't care that if any get gets on it, but yeah, it's, that's probably one of my favorite, favorite, and favorite so, practices that I do. And so how long is, t- what, what would be the the least amount of time you should have it on and, and the optimal time so that it is effective. I'd say no less than 30 minutes, but optimally like at least an hour. Um, so if you know, maybe you're sitting down to put it on, if you don't want to sleep in it, maybe you just wear it from, you know, seven to nine or eight to nine, you know, having kind of at least that hour time frame. I think that hour is kind of at least that sweet spot. But if you want to leave it on longer, you can. You can wear it during the afternoon. I've I've worn it before if I've had a stomach ache. You know, if my my digestive system doesn't feel right, I'll throw it on in the afternoon as I'm doing some work. And you know, there's there's no textbook time you need to wear it now. It's just nighttime's obviously a great time because you know, we're not wearing nice clothes. It doesn't, you know, we're in our comfy clothes, you know, our body's working on kind of replenishing, detoxing from the day. So that's kind of a, an optimal time, but that's not to say that there's not other times that you can wear it too, if that's what works for you. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for those tips. So on on another uh, topic uh, relating to detox, how does fasting help the body to detox? So this was something that I really did not know anything about until, you know, learning about especially fasting and cancer. I read Dr. Nisha Winter's book, uh, The Metabolic Approach to Cancer, and I think that's when my mind really opened up to this free tool of just extending our fasting time that's so easy that, you know, that, that so many people don't do. I mean, we eat at all hours of the day all day long, which it's great that we are able to get nourishment, hopefully, but but there's also so much healing benefit that can come from fasting. And so 
you know, it's really interesting. There's something that's called autophagy, which is just a really fun word that means cell cleanup. So it's, you know, your body is not worried about digesting. It's so when they say you hit autophagy, I don't know, the research is a little different people that you ask. They Some say you hit it at 15 hours. Some say it has to be over 17 hours. But autophagy is really when your body, it's not digesting anymore. So it can go through and it can clean up dead, damaged, cancerous or precancerous cells. It's really when our immune system is like, okay, we have nothing else to do. Let's go in and let's clean up the body. And we can do that through fasting. You can do it through especially like fasted exercise. So, you know, maybe you do like a 13, 14, 15, 16 hour overnight fast and you go for like a walk in the morning or you do a 30 to 40 minute workout. And if you do it fasted, you're getting into autophagy even sooner, which is interesting. And so, you know, in the fitness world, a lot of people say that fasted exercise, you know, it's really no different than if you eat before, but from like a detoxification, cancer prevention I see it as a very powerful thing that we can do to just be able to stimulate autophagy. We don't need to go crazy with it. You don't need to, you know, fast for 20 hours a day. I think we can get into trouble, especially, you know, if you're a healthy individual who doesn't have cancer or anything like that with over fasting, you know, we, we see both extremes. Um, but if you can kind of find where that middle ground is for you, it can be a very, very helpful tool. And if you look at the research on cancer, I mean, it's it's astounding. I mean, the, the people say fasting even before chemotherapy and how it protects your cells but kills the cancerous cells. I mean, it, it's pretty, it's really interesting. Yes. I, I recently on the podcast had uh, Jess Kelly, who is the co-author of The Metabolic Approach to Cancer, and she was sharing about how nutrition and fasting plays a role before you know chemotherapy and even after post to try and protect the body, like you're saying. So uh, I will put the link on that as well, just for those who are interested in learning more about that. I I completely agree. I, I kind of do intermittent fasting, and I kind of decide to stop eating early, and then I don't eat. I break my fast around 11 a.m., and I just feel like I, it has helped my hormones so much, uh, my, personally. Uh, but I was also told, and I'm curious, as you're kind of like the hormone expert on that sense, I, I heard that you know, women need to be careful with intermittent fasting and done according to your cycle. Have you heard that? Yes. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. And that's something that like when, when, you know, I was in this journey with my mom and I was like, mom, fasting is it? Like, we just have to fast, 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 fast. And like, she was postmenopausal at the point, but like, I'm cycling, I'm ovulating. And I got kind of into trouble. Like my cycle kind of, you know, lengthened a little bit. I don't, you know, so I, I didn't want to, you don't want to overstress your body. Um, so because if you are cycling and you are ovulating, you do want to just make sure in the second half of your cycle, after you've ovulated, progesterone is a really, really sensitive hormone. So I don't like to fast like more than 13 or 14 hours in the second part of my cycle. You know, I, I probably don't skip meals. Like I try to like nourish, but I still at least I'm always giving myself, you know, that 12 hours overnight, because like you said, you know, once we eat dinner, once we eat like an early dinner, I'm done for the night. And then, you know, I might just break my fast, you know, an hour or two earlier in the morning or or something like that. But you are right. A Mindy, Dr. Mindy Pels is a really great resource for that. I had her on my podcast and she like totally blew the minds of my listeners because we talked about, you know, with women, especially cycling, it's not black and white. It's not fast all the time or never fast at all. Whereas, you know, sometimes you hear both of those things where it's, it's really kind of in the middle and making it bio individualized to you and, and what works for you and for your hormones. But I'm on the same page with you. I intermittent fast in the first half of my cycle, I typically go 16 ish hours. Second half, like I said, I'm more 13 ish, 14. Uh, I try not to be as, as crazy with it just because I want to project, uh, protect my progesterone. Yeah, that that's so good. That's great advice. And yeah, and anyone listening who is in the cantering process or is having some issues, definitely speak to your functional medicine doctor, your naturopath, uh, because it's really important for them to look at you as an individual to see what is best for you. Uh, we're kind of sharing overview of different aspects of care today, but please make sure that you uh, consult with your physicians first before you do any type of facts, fasting for you as an individual. So one aspect that is not typically spoken about in conventional medicine is detoxing after chemotherapy. 
and uh, after someone's completed their treatments and they're done and you know they're they're finding so many studies that it can stay within your cells and the person is having a hard time getting back to them their old self and you know is you know is it true have you heard as well that those who exercise um going back to our infrared sauna that sweat 30 minutes daily are getting those residual toxins from chemo out faster than another detox method available? I can't imagine why that wouldn't be the case. You know, we think about all that we're able to get rid of. And I mean, we think about what chemotherapy is. I mean, it's chemicals that help kill cells in your body, including cancer cells. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's quite quite potent. Um, obviously you don't want to detox. And that was a question that I had when my mom was going through it is, you know, what can we do to support her liver as she's going through it? And they were like, you really want to be careful because you kind of just need to let it do what it needs to do. Um, so we really didn't focus on like more liver supporting sauna, all that kind of stuff until, until she was done. Um, just because you kind of don't want to mess with, with what it's supposed to do and hopefully do. Um, But yeah, I definitely think that when you kind of pair all of these different things, maybe some coffee enemas, you know, some different protocols that really like support glutathione and your body's ability to detox, maybe even like heavy metal type detox, because we know that those can be found in chemotherapy drugs that you definitely want to wait to do that after, but you can definitely clear it from your system, I would imagine quicker um, if you're doing those things. Yes, yes. I mean, I can't believe our time is almost up, but I wanted to ask you this last question because as someone who's gone through that cancer journey as a caregiver, what would be your best advice to someone in the midst of their cancer journey, knowing what you know now, and then what would, to a patient, and what would be your best advice to a caregiver who's listening today? Mm. Oh, wow. Okay. So I, I can rel- I can definitely relate on the caregiver standpoint, so I'll start with that one. And I think that one is you just have to be that person's best advocate. Um, luckily, I was really heavily researched, and I was at pretty much every appointment with my mom because if my parents were going to ask something, like I was right there with my notebook being like, are we testing her for Lyme? Are we testing her for mold? Are we doing all these things? And they were like, I didn't even know these things existed. And I didn't even know that you know those things. So I, I was in a point where I was like, I was, I probably read more cancer books than I honestly, quite, quite honestly ever care to, to read about, but I'm glad that I did because I was able to be a caregiver. And although I'm a, you know, I'm a doctor and stuff, I didn't learn about treating somebody with cancer or supporting someone with cancer in school. So you don't have to either. You can just be, you know, you could just I listened to all the podcasts. I listened to all the books. I, I I did all the things so that I could take all the knowledge and then really like be that advocate for my mom, you know, to make sure that she could get the care. And, and I would just heavily recommend that for caregivers because I was sending things over to my mom so that she also could be well-educated. But I think having cancer is just so incredibly overwhelming that if I could take a little bit of that burden off of her and do a little bit of that research, I found that that, that, that might've helped her, you know, so that she's not like constantly inundated with like, I need to one heal. And I also need to research and I need to learn. So I think if a caregiver can take that on, I think that that could be a very valuable tool. And, um, a tip for the patient, uh, I would say is that your body's the most incredible thing in the world. And, you know, we need to listen to it and we need to understand, you know, we need to understand why we have cancer in the first place so that we can heal and prevent it from ever coming back. And really, instead of stepping into this place of like, oh my gosh, this, you know, it's, it's horrible, but stepping into this place of empowerment and knowing that your body is very, very much so capable of amazing things. If we give it the space to do so, I think takes that person out of maybe that victim mindset and really steps them into the place of empowerment and, and really drive to wanting to heal. Mm. Those are great, great pieces of advice. And Dr. Haley, thank you so much for joining us today. It has just been such an honor to be with you. And uh, until next time, I have plenty of other topics I need to ask you questions about. So thank you for joining us this time. Of course. I, anytime you want to have me back, I'm more than happy to. All right. Thanks. If you 
enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support our podcast, please subscribe and share it with others. Be sure to visit believebig.org to access the show notes and discover our bonus content. Thanks again and keep believing big.